I just want to introduce some folks who are here and thank them enough, and then uh, we'll go through what the format's going to be today. So first I want to thank the ad hoc committee of the San Leandro City Council to review the future of the salon name of San Leandro Hospital and Community Healthcare. Um, and those folks are here. Um, Mayor Steve Caskey, who will be here in a minute. Vice Mayor Michael Gregory and Council Member Ursula Reed. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Chris Abata, who's the uh, city manager of San Leandro. Uh, we also have with us Vice Mayor of Alameda, Bob Bonta, and uh, we have uh, Senator Corbett staff, uh, Michelle, who's also going to make a statement. And uh, we also have with us uh, Carol Rogers from the um, Eden Township Healthcare District Board, and uh, Dr. Jennifer Ong uh, Eden, of the Eden Township Healthcare District Community Advisory Committee. So with that, um, I'd like to let Mayor Cassidy say a few words of welcome since this is his city. <clears throat> I'm going to be very brief because no one is here to listen to me today and I'm um, very interested in this report. Um, but what I do want to say though is I want to thank each and every one of you because you have a passion and interest in healthcare and I know many of you have are specifically committed to seeing San Leandro Hospital stay open and continue to serve the community, as am I, as am my colleagues on the City Council, and Supervisor Chan, uh, who's done an absolutely wonderful job standing up for San Leandro. And I just want to thank her, and um, of course, uh, Alex as well from the county. And, uh, and thank you, uh, Board Member Lee, for coming here to San Leandro, too, for your report. So, you know, let's continue to stay informed, let's continue to stay active, let's continue to make sure that San Leandro Hospital stays open. Yes. Okay, um, Michelle, would you like to read it? You have a statement from the Senator? Thank you. Uh, my name is Michelle Thomas, and I'm from Senator Ellen Corbett's office. Um, she's not able to be here today, but just wanted me to read a brief statement on her behalf. Um, thank you to the City of San Leandro and Supervisor Wilma Chain for holding this meeting today to talk about this important issue. I would also like to thank Board of Equalization Member Betty He for all of her work on this matter as well, and Alex for skill, of course. Um, for quite some time, I've been concerned about whether nonprofit hospitals are meeting their obligation. Last August, I requested a state audit to determine whether these hospitals are providing the public benefit required under current law to justify their tax exempt status. I look forward to seeing the state auditor's report, which is due out early this fall. In addition, I plan on holding a legislative hearing later this summer to probe this issue as well. We must get to the bottom of this question. Are taxpayers getting a fair deal? In exchange for the taxes, Nonprofit hospitals don't have to pay, are we getting the charity care they have pledged to provide? In today's complicated world of healthcare, it's essential for communities to know what they are getting with nonprofit hospitals. I look forward to continuing working with all of you on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure the Senator would have loved to have been here, but they're, they're somewhat otherwise occupied right this minute. Um, so, um, Again, welcome to everyone. And um, it's really interesting because someone was saying before before we started that this, this was kind of a wonky policy issue, but actually it's pretty simple in a way. Um, we have hospitals like uh, San Leandro Hospital, Sutter Corporation, and others who are not paying any tax, state taxes in the state of California because in exchange for that, they're supposed to be providing some benefits to the community. That's actually very simple to understand, right? So um, uh, California has lagged behind other states in terms of updating this kind of information um, and the regulations regarding the obligations of nonprofit hospitals in exchange for their tax-free status. Um, the community at large often is unaware of these requirements, but it's important for all of us to work together um, because to understand that these tax breaks come with obligations. Um, the Board of Equalization and Legislature has been examining the issue for a number of years through inquiries and audits. And um, as you heard, Senator Corbett uh, and I called for a state audit, and actually we've heard it's coming out in August, so it'll be out in a couple of months. 
Um, and so we felt it's time to look at the best practices of other states in this policy area and for California and to be changed either through changes in board of equalization regulations or legislation. And what we want to hear, we want to hear from you today after we finish the speakers in terms of ideas you may have to give to Ms. Yee or to give to Ellen Corbett or for us to pass on through the county regarding how we might want to consider tightening some of these regulations. Um, of course, in San Leandro, Sutter Health is the biggest nonprofit hospital serving the area. So in some ways they can provide a test case for what exists today and what future additional requirements or regulations might be. And just for your information, some of the other hospitals receiving this tax exam status are Kaiser Permanente, the public um, hospitals like ACMC, the district hospitals. But clearly in the state, the two largest um, systems are Kaiser and Sutter who are receiving this, um, this benefit. So this hearing will explore these issues um, as a first step towards possible state action. So our agenda today, we're going to hear from Alex Briscoe, um, and you may, some of you may have seen this before, but we're very fortunate to have him here today. He's going to give us a, a snapshot of, on the situation of acute care and the hospital situation in Central County, so we can kind of see what's at stake here. I mean, of course, all of you know what's at stake here, but to kind of remind us um, of some of the facts and figures regarding that. And we're really fortunate to have um, Betty Yee here from the California State Board of Equalization. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about Betty. I've known her for a number of years. When I was in the state legislature, she was working for the Department of Finance. Um, she currently represents the first equalization district in 21 counties. It's a big area in northern and central California. She has over 25 years of experience in public service and she has specialized in state and local finance. As I said, she previously served as Chief Deputy Director for Budget with the California Department of Finance, where she led the development of the governor's budget negotiation with the legislature and key budget stakeholders and fiscal analysis of legislation on behalf of the administration. Um, I could go on and on and on, but I'm sure you want to hear from her instead of hearing just about her. But let me tell you, um, when I was in the legislature and following her career, there's no one who is more grounded and more serious about these type of issues um, facing the community and more knowledgeable about California finances um, than she is. So I hope you all have a lot of questions for her because I'm sure she can answer each and every one of them in a very um, thorough manner. So we're very fortunate to have her today. So after we hear from Alex and Betty, um, we'll kind of um, have a little break and then I'll tell you we're going to move into some San Leandro specific um, information. And then we're going to have um, a time for public testimony and questions. So that's basically the format today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to move really quickly through a bunch of data. Um, but I'm actually going to tell you the end of the story first. So I'm going to give you the takeaway. So if I spontaneously combust in the middle of all this data, you'll know what to think. And the message I'm trying to deliver is a very small number of safety net hospitals provide the vast, vast majority of care to the under uninsured. So while all hospitals provide some charity care, a small number provide the vast, vast majority of it and carry the vast burden of the under uninsured. And when I say uninsured, I mean Title 19 programs, Medicaid and Medicare. So all the data I'm about to give you is available on our website. Some of you may have seen it before. So I'll move quickly. Feel free to stop me at any time. But you know, we're here to, um, I'm here particularly to hear from Betty. So I just want to set the groundwork about um, what acute care is in Alameda County. There you go. So this is our county where 1.5 million people. We're the fifth largest county in uh, California, or sixth, I think now. Um, but we're a really interesting blend of urban and rural uh, population, so we're really an interesting petri, petri dish for the county. My predecessor, Dave Kears, had a great line of all. He said, Alameda County has San Francisco's politics, LA's problems, and Fresno's resources. <laughs> Um, um, and obviously, any uh, discussion of general acute care has to be held in the context of the rising number of uninsured. Um, this graphic just quickly shows you that in 2008, according to the American Health Survey, there were over 166,000 uninsured Alameda County residents. Nothing good has happened to low-income people since 2008. That number is now at about 200,000, 199,030 as of 2010. That number has actually increased. We believe it's about 220,000. Alameda County residents are currently uninsured. 
And it's actually, like all healthcare, healthcare is all local. So the conversation we're having around San Diego Hospital, it can only be understood in the context of specific communities and specific people. This graphic shows you where the uninsured are by city of origin in Alameda County. And so you'll see the Ashland and the unincorporated areas has the highest rate up at 23%, Hayward at 17%, Oakland at 17%, and San Leandro, I know is about 14%. I can't remember which one it is there, but it's in there, I promise. Um, and also, the, vast, the important thing to understand is the vast number of the uninsured are adults, not children. Um, and I will just quickly say that we know what expanded coverage looks like for children. In fact, Supervisor Chan has led the effort in this county to try to ensure all children who are eligible get unenrolled. So the approximately 20,000 uninsured children in Alameda County, 13,000 are eligible but not enrolled for Medi-Cal and Healthy Families. And that's, um, frankly, a failure of all of ours, that these young people are eligible for a comprehensive health benefit that they are not accessing. So what is the problem? There is not now, nor there will ever be in the foreseeable future, an adequate supply of primary and preventative care. Just as a very simple mathematical equation, Dr. Thomas Bodenheimer at UCSF has a great study at his website. The actual primary care workforce is aging out. We're losing access to primary care. So one of the great services that we offer in Western medicine is access to primary care, but there's not enough of it, it's under reimbursed, and it's actually shrinking. So we drive utilization to the highest cost levels, mainly in hospitals. We're over 50% of what's seen in Alameda County's emergency departments could have been handled at primary care if such primary care was available or accessible. We also know that healthcare costs are rising at five times the rate of wages, and premiums for every employer have doubled in the last decade and are scheduled to double again. As I mentioned, we drive cost of uh, care to the highest cost settings. And the general acute care system in Alameda County relies on public sector subsidies for the handful of safety net hospitals that serve the majority of the underinsured. That's the point I hope you walk away with today. So this another piece of scary information is that California ranks 51st in the nation in emergency department capacity per 1,000 residents. And lots of smart people probably are saying, well, how do you get to be 51st? And the answer is we beat Puerto Rico. Uh, we did not beat the District of Columbia or any other state. And that's a dramatic problem. That's a problem not only because of disaster preparedness, but it's also a really important problem because when you look at other jurisdictions that had expanded coverage, like Vermont and Massachusetts, you saw a significant increase in ED utilization. So remember how I said there's not enough primary care? But now a whole bunch of new people are insured. Where do you go? From Fala, you go to the ED. So 7 to 10%, almost double digit increases in utilization when you expand coverage. And safety net providers, particularly general acute care providers, have to look at competition in a post reform healthcare market. You can't do it on subsidies alone. You have to be able to attract private pay and commercial pay where you can make a better margin. And this is uh, largely what we're talking about here is the idea that safety net hospitals also have to achieve alliances or partnerships to get the same economies of scale that health systems like Kaiser and Sutter already enjoy. This graphic shows you all 14 911 receiving centers. So every hospital with a dot there is a licensed hospital, but not every licensed hospital offers general acute care services, including a 911 receiving center. There are 14 hospitals that receive 911 traffic in Alameda County and have an Intala, um focused emergency room. When you actually map them on the map, there's the 14, and there's actually only 13 there because Kaiser, Fremont, and Hayward are actually licensed under the same license. So when I show you the data, you'll actually see 13 data points instead of 14, but there's actually 14 hospitals. This just shows you general acute care by hospital system. So again, you see the Kaiser Hayward looks so big that it's actually two hospitals. And what you're looking here is ED visits and ED admitted and other inpatient in blue, red, and green. And so this is just a snapshot to show you total volume. Certain hospitals obviously see more people. But then when you take this same uh, graphic and look at emergency department visits, you'll also see the single busiest emergency department is obviously Highlands, the Alameda County Medical Center's level two trauma service with over 90,000 ED visits a year. The reason you see slightly less than 90,000 there is that this data is scrubbed just for Alameda County residents. So we only, we pulled all the OSHPA data together and then sucked out anyone who didn't live in Alameda County because we really wanted to focus on the residents who live here. Um, this is the percent of the uninsured who are seen in emergency departments and you'll see the medical center highest at 66, Alameda, St. Rose. San Leandro is certainly above the, uh, the average down there at 16.3, but the reason it's so low is because the vast majority of San Leandro hospital ED users are actually in Medicare. I'll show you that in a second. 
This graphic shows you, and probably perhaps the most important, emergency department payer sources. So really what you should be looking at here is the blue and the red. And the blue and the red basically show you your Medi-Cal and your indigent. And then the orange on the far right-hand side is your Medicare volumes. So again, the focus on San Leandro is pretty significant among the highest in the county Medicare volumes, relatively high Medi-Cal volumes. So you're really, again, seeing the focus in San Leandro of Medi-Cal, Medicare, and some indigent. One important thing that we track on behalf of Alameda County citizens is the number of how, how busy emergency departments are. And your 911 system is managed under Supervisor Chan and the Board of Supervisors' leadership to ensure that every 911 center, when they get overburdened, have the support of the other receiving centers. This is called diversion. And when you look at the hospitals that go on diversion the most often, you'll see five hospitals go on diversion the most often. Eden, Island, San Leandro, St. Rose, and Alta Bay Sun. So um, that means that those hospitals are the busiest. Now, diversion is an imperfect measure for being busy, because lots of things can put you on diversion. Your ICU could be full, your inpatient side could be full. So this is careful to take this with a grain of salt, but it's, it's meaningful. When a hospital calls and says, hey, we can't take any more ambulance travel. So let's just map those five hospitals on a map. And up will come the five that I just referenced Summit, Highland, San Leandro, Eden, and St. Rose. And if you're familiar with our epidemiological work, you should know what's coming. And when you take those same hospitals and you map them for poverty, you'll see that those five hospitals serve the highest concentrations of poverty in Alameda County. Again, those are the safety net hospitals in Alameda County. Why that's important, those are the same communities that have the highest concentration of people who are newly eligible under health care reform. So the pressure of the facing those hospitals will be exacerbated by the coverage expansion that we hope is upheld in the Supreme Court in the next couple of weeks. Another piece of interesting data that just came out of Oshpod was taking a look at which communities use the emergency department more often. So the, what you see up here is the darker color, the red and orange, refer to those zip codes that use emergency department at a higher rate than the rest of the county, and you'll see a common theme here. The communities with the highest concentration of poverty also use emergency departments at the highest rate. And then we need to take one more scrub, which is who used the emergency department for the lowest acuity reasons, right? Or if they had another place could have gotten care, you'll see the same map. One little exception down there in Fremont. But basically, what this stuff tells us is that certain communities who have the highest concentration of poverty use the emergency department the most often. The emergency departments they use are the safety net hospitals that disproportionately carry the burden of the under and uninsured. This just shows you on um, days of the week that we go on the version. It's actually Monday through Friday. This was a surprise to us. When we did focus groups with emergency room doctors, we learned that everyone knows not to shift big Mondays. <laughs> everyone will interrupt their Monday, no one will interrupt their weekend. And then noon to midnight is the time that uh, hospitals call on the version. So when you look at inpatient hospital visits, um, this is your total number of inpatient hospital visits. Again, Kaiser Hayward is shown above because it's a, a combination of Hayward and Fremont. Um, but when you look down at San Leandro, San Leandro's actually inpatient volume is relatively low. Well. I don't need to tell folks in this room that. Um, censuses have ho hovered between 32 and 40 for quite some time. So it's not San Leandro's inpatient volume that is so essential, but it's important. I don't want to minimize it. It's really its access as a receiving center and a broker of care, particularly for the Medicare population, that makes it such an essential player, particularly in our 911 system that is already under-resourced. Um, this is inpatient uh, visions estimated as a percentage of the uninsured, and you'll see in this graphic, San Leandro climbs higher, right? That higher percentage of San Leandro's inpatient admits are actually uninsured, about 5.4%, um, which as you can see, puts it fourth in the county, the fourth highest percentage of uninsured. Uh, our senior in San Leandro. Um, and this is one of my last slides. This is inpatient visit payer source. And so again, to focus on San Leandro, you'll see the single largest percentage of Medicare volumes. So now, that's really important, first of all, because um, the elderly population of Alameda County needs a place to get care. It's absolutely essential. But think about it also from a dem demographic perspective. Alameda County is aging, and it's aging dramatically. In fact, um, I just forgot the exact percentage, so as a chance probably remembers, but it's an 80 or 90 percent increase by 2020 in the total number of people living over 65. So as important as this is right now for our senior population to get access to um, inpatient beds and specialty care and outpatient surgery and emergency department use, this problem will only get worse over time as our population ages and we need more access to Medicare uh, inpatient facilities. So again, here are the takeaways that I'd like you to walk away from. 
um, safety in the hospitals face real and significant revenue challenges. If you look at how San Leandro, at how the medical center, at how San Rose, and how Children's Hospital are sustained, it's mind-numbing. The amount of time, effort, and expertise it takes to underwrite and sustain these critical safety net resources. And the reason is the data I just showed you. A certain set of hospitals see the vast majority of the commercially insured, and another set of hospitals see the vast majority of the Title 19, Medicare, Medicaid, and the uninsured. And actually, one last comment on that. If, if you look at this over time, it hasn't changed. The general acute care economy in Alameda County has been stable with this distribution of payers for more than a decade. That's as far back as we went. The loss of additional general acute care facilities and their 911 receiving centers will compromise our county's health care service delivery system, in particular those communities with the highest need. So I showed you that demographic around utilization of EED largely just to show you how essential these hospitals are, not just for the broader healthcare system, but also for the, margin, the communities, the most vulnerable and most marginalized communities who need access to care. And finally, safety net hospitals, particularly designated public and non-designated public hospital systems. Non-designated public means district, right? Um, must seek new and converged operating structures. We have to establish partnerships among the safety net so that we can share best practices, share economies of scale, the era of a standalone small community hospital being viable is over. It's really difficult for small standalones to make it. That doesn't mean that they're not as essential as they ever were. The care they provide is absolutely essential, but the challenge we all face is developing a sustainable operating structure for them to thrive. Thank you. that is uh, available for nonprofit hospitals. And this is really to provide a context for uh, the discussion that will follow with respect to um, what are the community benefits that nonprofit hospitals are providing um, and because they do get special tax treatment uh, relative to welfare exemption. Um, so I'm going to just ask, um, we'll just go through some slides very quickly and then some are going to be a little bit more specific to uh, the Eden Medical Center under which the uh, information for San Diego Hospital is embedded. So when we talk about, on um, slide two, the welfare exemption, just what are we talking about? Uh, for uh, a number of years now, and actually for many decades, California has uh, provided an exemption from property taxation for property that is used for uh, a number of different purposes. For uh, exclusively for religious purposes, hospital purposes, charitable purposes, or scientific purpose. And uh, these properties also have to be owned and operated by nonprofit organizations that are organized and operating for these specific purposes. And the authority for this exists under our uh, California Revenue Taxation Code, Section 214. Next slide, please. Uh, what's complicated about the welfare exemption and why you don't hear about it is because uh, it is quite um, uh, complex with respect to its administration. Uh, there are two entities that are responsible for administering this welfare exemption. Uh, the State Board of Equalization and then each of the uh, county assessors, uh, uh, each of the 58 uh, independently elected county assessors. Uh, the uh, bifurcated uh, administration uh, is delineated by uh, respective responsibilities for each of these um, entities. State Board of Equalization uh, looks at uh, an organization and determines whether the organization is eligible uh, for the exemption, and if so, or, uh, issues what we call an organizational clearance certificate. So what we do in terms of determining whether an organization is eligible, we look at the type of activities that the organization is involved in, uh, we do look at uh, their budgets and uh, their operation with respect to uh, the types of revenue coming in, uh, the expenses that are incurred, and uh, also look at their um, uh, uh, formation uh, documents or articles of incorporation to be sure that the purpose for which they are uh, operating uh, is consistent with the purpose for which they are seeking the, uh, the uh, organization term certificate. So once the certificate is issued, um, it is not revoked uh, unless uh, there is cause for uh, concerned that uh, they have not, uh, that the organization is not operating uh, for its intended purpose. So it remains valid unless it's revoked. The county assessors uh, then look at the organizations for which the certificate has been issued and determine the specific use of the property 
and uh, we'll look at whether the property uh, qualifies for the exemption. Uh, in order for the property to qualify for the exemption, it has to be used exclusively for the purpose for which the uh, organizational permit certificate has been issued. And uh, an exemption cannot be granted unless an organization holds an organizational permit certificate. Next slide, please. So we took a look back over the last 10 years to see what exactly is the value of the hospital exemption. And um, when you look at this chart, uh, this is, uh, these are dollars expressed in thousands. Uh, this chart uh, looks at the assessed value of property. And because these are, for the most part, uh, properties exempted from property tax, I'm going to ask you to look at these figures with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, salt. Because assessors don't have uh, dedicated resources to look at exempted properties because they're not generating revenue. Uh, on an ongoing basis. But what we do know is that over the last 10 years, um, the uh, hospital exemption, the value of the hospital exemption has uh, doubled uh, over the last 10 years. And that's uh, pretty uh, much on target with respect to the value of the exemption here in Alameda County. And there are a number of reasons for um, uh, the amount of uh, the value of the uh, exemption going up. Uh, first, uh, we know that uh, there are hospitals that are um, engaged in major, major uh, physical plant expansion. Of, uh, and, and one of the drivers uh, may be uh, the requirements for complying with seismic safety requirements. And so uh, there are uh, hospitals are actively engaged in trying to meet those requirements, uh, either with uh, complete renovation, uh, erecting new structures altogether. Uh, but this uh, does constitute a new construction, which is subject to uh, uh, an increased uh, assessed value and, and reassessment. Uh, secondly, uh, we think that uh, the, the the knowledge about the hospital exception uh, certainly is becoming uh, more and more known. So uh, there actually may be hospitals that are uh, now uh, finally claiming the exemption uh, that have not been uh, over the period of the last 10 years. And, uh, and then, so the utilization, utilization in general has gone up over the last 10 years. And then um, we also have had uh, county assessors begin to record uh, better information with respect to the hospital exemption. The board does survey every county assessor's office uh, every five years. There's a five-year cycle uh, within which we go into every county assessor's office, look at uh, different types of property uh, that is under their jurisdiction. And as part of that survey process, we've been able to also ascertain that uh, assessors are keeping better track uh, of the uh, of hospital properties as well and what is uh, subject to the exemption. Next slide, please. So it's a little bit of a misnomer because um, when we think about a nonprofit entity, we generally think of uh, a nonprofit organization that uh, don't really carry what looks like a profit on the books. And uh, in the case of nonprofit hospitals, uh, we actually can have, uh, and the law does allow, uh, for operating revenues to exceed operating expenses for nonprofit hospitals. And when we um, talk about uh, net operating income, uh, when we refer to net operating income, and this will be uh, relevant uh, in the uh, we're talking about uh, operating revenue less operating expenses. And the additional revenue that they carry on the books, what we call surplus revenue, is net operating revenue that exceeds operating expenses by an amount equivalent to 10% of those operating expenses. So in other words, uh, net operating revenues, uh, which uh, excludes things like gifts, endowments, and grants and aid, uh, that this uh, surplus revenue can actually um, uh, be in, in an amount equivalent to 10% of operating expenses, and hospitals are able to carry this amount on the books if the 10%, the surplus revenue, is used for specific purposes. And uh, the surplus revenue must be used for uh, purposes like debt retirement, uh, plant and facilities expansion, uh, or uh, be held in a reserve for contingencies. And this authority came about as a result of a uh, California appellate court decision uh, called the write-out decision, which uh, specifically uh, affirmed that these are allowable purposes for surplus revenue uh, to be held by a hospital organization. And this is something that uh, the legislature has tried to uh, address, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The reason I think uh, many of us are here today, and certainly uh, the reason why the board began to look at this issue almost 10 years ago, uh, really uh, emerged from a number of different uh, things that came to our attention. Uh, first of all, uh, many of you may remember back in about 2005, almost nationwide, we were picking up the newspaper every day and reading about the high CEO compensation of nonprofit hospitals. And, uh, and that was really true across the country. It also caught Congress's attention, certainly caught the Internal Revenue Service's attention. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment in terms of uh, the IRS's response. But certainly high CEO compensation of nonprofit hospitals, a little bit of a disconnect when you think about, gee, aren't these hospitals supposed to be uh, serving uh, uh, 
underinsured, uninsured, providing charity care, and yet we have CEOs that are earning a high, a high level of compensation. Uh, we also uh, were concerned about the minimal provision of charity care to medically or financially injured persons. Uh, as the state uh, certainly uh, began to see more of a burden in terms of picking up the costs of uh, providing health care coverage uh, to these uh, uh, uninsured and underinsured uh, uh, individuals, uh, we began to add the question, uh, what is the role of hospitals in picking up some of this slide, and particularly since they are receiving uh, a tax benefit, uh, a tax exemption. We also uh, had uh, findings from uh, a state auditor's report that showed uh, and, and really confirmed and affirmed for many of us who were thinking that really today, nonprofit hospitals' provision of charity care uh, is uh, really significantly less than those from our for profit hospitals. The idea that um, for profit hospitals really are carrying um, a good portion of the burden for providing charity care. Uh, was affirmed uh, in a state auditor's report, and in fact, they found no difference uh, between the two types of hospitals. And so, again, uh, the nonprofit hospitals receiving a welfare exemption and not really uh, showing much with respect to uh, increased uh, provision of charity care. Uh, the uh, concern about the use of the property uh, exemption, uh, property tax exemption for for profit entities. Uh, there was a concern uh, expressed, and, and much of this came about when we saw hospitals really. Uh, very, very active in uh, expansion of their services, expansion of their facilities. Uh, we saw the influx of these uh, freestanding surgical centers, uh, laboratories, and uh, there was uh, a significant concern about uh, where the funding, the financing of that was coming from. And so uh, the thought that uh, these nonprofit hospitals, you know, were, were some of the, uh, either any of the property or any of the uh, revenue being uh, funneled to uh, some of these for-profit entities. And so that certainly created concern with respect to a uh, review of the welfare exemption. Uh, we had heard uh, anecdotally, uh, and again, this was something that hit the papers across the nation with respect to very, very aggressive debt collection practices by nonprofit hospitals. Here, these were hospitals that were uh, providing services to um, many, many uh, either medically or financially indigent persons, and yet uh, in order to receive payment for their services, um, just some very, very severe uh, measures that were taken by these hospitals to uh, try to collect from, from these uh, patients, including um, putting uh, debt collection agencies uh, on, on these persons who owed uh, money to these hospitals. And then um, what we're here really to talk about, and uh, I think the general interest with respect to, the, uh, to these nonprofit hospitals is what is the uh, value of the welfare exemption and other tax, special tax provisions that uh, these hospitals are eligible for and receive? Uh, and how does that comport with the value of the community benefits that they actually provide? And that is really the equation that we're trying to get a handle on, certainly at the state level. I think as uh, issues come up locally uh, with respect to uh, the type of care that uh, local hospitals are providing, and, and knowing that these hospitals are receiving some special tax treatment, this is also the same equation that uh, you'll be uh, dealing with uh, here locally as well. Now, the legislature has long been interested in this issue, and um, in fact, I want to applaud Supervisor Chan because uh, she has been really stalwart at uh, continuing to keep an eye out for uh, the uh, role of the hospital community in providing uh, these types of uh, uh, services to particularly medically and financially indigent persons. So we have a whole legislative history of um, bills that have been enacted to, uh, that affect nonprofit hospitals and really had a specific purpose in mind. Uh, all the way dating back to 1994. Uh, the write-out decision that I mentioned earlier was a California Appellate Court decision uh, dating back to 1992. And so the legislature became, uh, began to get very interested with respect to, okay, so you can carry a surplus, uh, or surplus revenue on your books, uh, what all are you doing with your money? And so in 1994, uh, Senator Torres uh, had a bill enacted that uh, provides that nonprofit parcel organizations uh, are required to conduct a community needs assessment uh, develop a community uh, benefit plan in consultation with uh, the community, uh, evaluating the health needs of the community uh, that is serviced by the hospital, uh, prioritizing these needs and developing a plan for addressing these needs, and assigning an economic value to the benefits provided, and to annually support a copy of its, uh, submit a copy of this plan to OSHPED uh, at the state. Now, uh, that's a mouthful. Uh, I think if you were to ask any hospital today if they're doing this, they will say, yes, we are complying with the law. Uh, the problem is when we look at this data that is provided, it's very, very difficult to look at uh, how to translate this data that really helps us uh, come to grips with the equation that we just talked about. What is the value of the community benefits and uh, is it closer or equal to or greater than or less than uh, the amount of the tax exemption that they're receiving? 
1687 by Senator Member Frommer, and in 2003 established a, a Payers' Bill of Rights. And uh, this required a hospital uh, with the uh, certain exemptions for uh, small rural hospitals uh, to use, uh, that uses a charge uh, description master to make available a written or electronic copy uh, of uh, their uh, uh, charge uh, uh, description master. And it also required hospitals to post a notice uh, that informs patients that the hospital's charge description master is available. Uh, to the public. And this is really to provide some uh, better uh, transparency with respect to uh, hospital charges. And this payer's uh, bill of rights was intended to uh, bring more transparency and be able to have uh, anyone who wanted to take a look at what the hospital was doing to be able to get that information. Uh, Supervisor Chian then in 2006 established the hospital fair pricing policy for California hospitals and uh, here, effective in January 2007, they required each licensed general acute care uh, hospital, uh, psychiatric acute hospital, and special hospital to increase public awareness of the availability of charity care, payment discounts, and government-sponsored health insurance, and to standardize its billing and collection procedures. And uh, I think as we look at hospitals across the state, um, and I'm hopeful that they are continuing to still comply with uh, the requirements of this bill, uh, but uh, as we did our uh, review that I'm going to talk about momentarily, uh, I think it's very clear just given the figures that were reported that uh, each hospital uh, there's no consistency among hospitals in terms of uh, how they are keeping uh, this information. And then uh, finally, in uh, 2007, uh, Senator Runner, uh, who uh, coincidentally is now a member of the State Board of Equalization, uh, amended uh, portions of the Health and Safety Code that relate to uh, hospital, char hospital charity care and discount payment policies. And uh, each hospital is required to submit a, cop a copy of its uh, charity care and discount payment policies to Oshkosh. And as we did our uh, examination of all the nonprofit hospitals uh, several years ago, uh, we did find that many hospitals do have charity care policies um, that are developed internally. Uh, not a lot of, uh, not sure the degree of community review, and uh, certainly no uh, uh, approval by uh, local uh, uh, governmental entities. Now, uh, next slide, please. There were other uh, concerns that continue to keep legislature interested in this issue, and that is uh, really feeling the pinch of. Uh, uh, Health care costs being a major cost driver in the state budget. Uh, there were several legislators, uh, and I want to applaud uh, former Senator Deborah Ortiz for uh, keeping on this issue. Uh, but she had uh, made several attempts to try to establish a charity care standard and, uh, uh, and policy to reduce payments uh, for hospitals by statute. And uh, she tried in 2004 and 2005. Both bills did not um, move through successfully through the legislative process. and. Um, 2005 even made uh, these requirements a condition of maintaining their tax exempt status. So really uh, a hammer for um, uh, the, the consequence of not being able to provide this uh, information uh, would uh, jeopardize their tax exempt status. And then we have in 2005, uh, former Senator uh, Johan Clays, or Senator Johan Clays, uh, would have overturned the, the right out decision in a bill that he carried. Uh, and this was really looking at that 10% surplus revenue threshold that I talked about. Uh, what he wanted to try to do in the bill was to establish that uh, surplus revenue threshold as a ceiling rather than a floor. And uh, so even though we had a number of hospitals that reported uh, uh, re operating revenues that were greater than operating expenses, to the extent that it didn't hit that 10% uh, amount of operating expenses, it was not uh, characterized as surplus revenue. Okay. So those are the, the legislative responses to uh, some of the concerns that we share. Uh, let me talk a little bit next slide about what the Board of Equalization did. Um, we began a review in 2009. Uh, prior to 2009, what we had done was uh, hospitals uh, that had an organizational clearance certificate pretty much received what we I would characterize as a, uh, a desk audit every five years. And at the time, because there were so many hospital entities, we did it by um, the alphabet. So depending on what um, letter of the alphabet the name of the hospital began with, you would be up for um, a, a desk audit review. Uh, there was no way to really look at the whole industry and to really begin to get a sense of um, uh, looking at uh, trends uh, and even comparing uh, hospital organizations uh, to one another. So in 2009, uh, I had proposed to the board that we look at a survey uh, that could look at all the hospitals simultaneously and to get some consistent reporting uh, by each of the uh, hospital organizations. Uh, this review encompassed about 174 organizations uh, covering a four-year period from 2005 to 2008. And it also included collecting data on uh, community benefit and charity care 
bad debt expense and care provided to Medicare, Medicare and County Indigent Program recipients. And uh, even though we could not and we were not equipped to analyze the data relative to uh, this last bullet, uh, what we wanted was just to see what the different entities would report. And this uh, report is public, it's on our website. Uh, so if you go to www.boe.ca.gov uh, under property tax, you can uh, probably pull up the report pretty easily. Uh, but this was just a way to uh, just have an ability to look at um, hospital organization across one another to see whether uh, there were some trends and certain consistency in the reporting that we did ascertain. Now what we examined, because this is uh, squarely within our purview, when we look at the uh, hospital organization's eligibility for the organizational parent certificate, uh, we want to see that each hospital uh, was still in good standing, and so uh, the uh, status of uh, holding the organizational parent certificate was still valid. Uh, we looked at their formative documents, these are their articles of incorporation, to be sure that they still were meeting their uh, intended uh, purpose. And uh, we looked at their tax exemption letters uh, from the uh, Internal Revenue Service or uh, other tax agencies, franchise tax board, uh, to that extent. Financial statements, uh, we looked at operating revenue and expenses, and then the use of their surplus revenue that they had. So they met up against that 10% threshold uh, and uh, did report a surplus revenue uh, of that um, uh, degree. We then wanted to be sure that they were uh, utilizing that surplus revenue for the purposes I uh, talked about earlier debt retirement, fiscal plan expansion, uh, reserve for operating contingency. Next slide, please. So of the 147 organizations that we examined, we uh, found that 24 had surplus revenue. And that is operating revenue that exceeded operating expenses by 10% or more of these expenses. So again, uh, this 10% is really uh, a floor and not a ceiling. Uh, we did not disqualify any of these organizations from exemption because the way that they reported the surplus revenue and uh, uh, it, it did indicate that it was being used for one, of the more, one or more of the acceptable purposes as was uh, detailed in the right out decision. Uh, as, um, the predominant use of them being for significant construction projects, uh, new hospitals or expansion of existing facilities. Next slide please. We found actually in doing the survey that 29 of the um, organizations were misclassified as operating for a hospital purpose. Um, in fact, they did not operate as an acute care facility or qualify as a hospital or an outpatient multi-specialty clinic. And in this instance, what we did was uh, we advised these organizations of their exemption qualification under the charitable purpose. So they're not eligible for the property tax welfare exemption under the hospital purpose, but they were eligible under the charitable purpose. Uh, 10 organizations had name changes, so we issued new organization clearance certificates to reflect the name changes. 21 organizations were no longer seeking exemptions. Uh, they either had dissolved or merged with other uh, entities. So we revoked the organizational clearance certificates for these organizations. And then we had two organizations that did not respond uh, to multiple requests for information to review them. And so we uh, uh, proceeded to revoke the organizational clearance certificates held by these organizations. Next slide, please. Now, as I said, we also compiled data uh, from these uh, organizations that uh, we did not analyze because we are not equipped to analyze them, but uh, we uh, have requested them because at the same time, uh, these organizations were uh, preparing this information for the new requirement of reporting on their federal form 990 that the Internal Revenue Service was now requiring. And uh, this type of information included uh, revenues and expenses, uh, and they were preparing this for, as I said, reporting on their uh, IRS form 990. A copy of their community benefit plans and charity care policies and the uh, actual costs of their charity care. Uh, bad debt expense uh, that they incurred to care for underinsured or uh, uninsured uh, persons. Uh, the use of collection agencies for collection on banking accounts. Uh, the care for Medicare, Medi-Cal, and County Indigent Program recipients and related contractual adjustments. And then discounted medical care provided for patients uh, other than those under the programs that I just mentioned. So this is uh, just data that we collected and most of the hospital organizations did provide that data. Next slide, please. Now, also in response to the concerns that I um, articulated earlier, the Bureau of State Audits uh, also did a review of uh, nonprofit hospitals. And uh, probably the most significant finding uh, here uh, is that uh, when you look at uh, the value of the benefit to communities uh, that nonprofit hospitals uh, provide, that uh, there was essentially no difference than the value of the benefits that uh, for-profit hospitals provide. So the idea here that for-profit hospitals don't qualify for the welfare exemption uh, the, from property tax, and yet uh, non-profit hospitals do, but the value of the community benefits essentially were no different between for-profit hospitals and non-profit hospitals. 
uh, the Bureau of State Audits also uh, found that uh, the Franchise Tax Board could also more closely monitor the tax exempt status of nonprofit hospitals. And again, uh, I, I, having been a former member of the Franchise Tax Board, when you look at exempt entities, and this is true of county assessors as well, uh, because these entities are not generating revenue, uh, the workload associated with it is probably not going to get a lot of priority. But uh, to the extent that uh, we should be scrutinizing whether uh, the exemptions are being held by entities that are complying with uh, you know, their other requirements of providing community benefits, uh, that was something that the Bureau of State Audits to highlight uh, on the focus of attention to going forward. Next slide, please. So as I said, the Internal Revenue Service also responded uh, with respect to some of these concerns that we've been reading about uh, relative to nonprofit hospitals. Beginning with the 2008 tax year, uh, nonprofit hospitals are required to complete a new Schedule H uh, to the Form 990 and uh, reporting, among other things, and these are new requirements that they need to report to uh, the IRS, uh, community benefits provided, information related to their charity care policies, and any for-profit ventures involving their executives and physicians. And again, remember I mentioned that one of the concerns that really brought rise to our review is the allegation that because these are nonprofit hospitals that uh, uh, perhaps uh, the expansion of uh, some of these uh, for-profit entities like the freestanding surgical centers, laboratories, and other uh, types of facilities uh, were uh, being uh, made possible because of uh, directing some of the revenues of the nonprofit hospitals uh, and or use of uh, other, uh, whether it's uh, human resources or, or other resources of the nonprofit. Um, I want to turn the um, attention over uh, this next slide to what's been happening in other states. A lot of focus obviously here locally in San Leandro, here in California. Uh, this is not a new issue for any state. Uh, and uh, uh, for a long time, uh, I know that California has looked at the charity care law in Texas, and this has been in existence since 1993. Uh, to establish minimum levels of charity care that must be provided by nonprofit hospitals as a condition of retaining their tax exempt status. And to also, uh, in order for the state to track what is happening with these hospitals, to establish uniform planning, budgeting, and reporting related to charity care and community benefit activities. Now, uh, there are three approaches, three standards that uh, hospitals uh, can utilize to uh, meet the, this requirement of uh, a minimum level of charity care and uh, they're highlighted in these, in these bullets, that uh, essentially uh, they can have a charity care slash community benefits mix, so both provision of care and also broader uh, uh, services to the community or services to the broader community, uh, that mix. Uh, it could be uh, satisfied through standard where uh, they are uh, providing uh, care that is equal to 100% of the tax exempt benefit. And then there's also a reasonable standard, uh, standard where uh, there is some judgment made as to uh, uh, other activities that the hospital may be engaged in, or the facility may be engaged in, or the system may be engaged in, that is uh, that can satisfy uh, this minimum level of charity care. Now, hospital systems; uh, these are systems that comprise uh, multiple facilities that satisfy uh, these standards on a consolidated basis, so they can actually put together all their activities and satisfy the minimum level of charity care uh, on a consolidated basis. Now, we also have seen uh, a lot of other states uh, get into the mix. Um, earlier, this, and probably uh, many of you have been reading what Illinois just did earlier this month, which was pretty remarkable. Uh, as a result of a uh, Illinois Supreme Court decision in 2010 in the Provena Covenant Medical Center versus Department of Revenue case, uh, the uh, property tax exemptions were being revoked uh, by uh, the state. And because um, there really wasn't a way to demonstrate uh, and to really substantiate what hospitals were providing relative to community benefits. And uh, there was a great degree of concern by the industry and even by lawmakers in Illinois, and certainly by the governor, that um, we could keep um, revoking these uh, property tax exemptions or these tax exemptions, uh, or it really could put the healthcare system under. At the same time, uh, there was also an interest to be sure that we could provide, that they could provide clearer standards for how to uh, meet uh, a community benefit requirement or charity care uh, standards. So uh, what the governor signed earlier this month uh, was an expansion of the definition of charity care uh, to include a larger category of uh, community benefits and probably uh, more similarly uh, mirroring uh, what the IRS rules are. And uh, this is the, the community benefits uh, could uh, even be uh, something that is not on an um, individual patient basis, but really are um, benefits that serve uh, the community at large, um, and this could qualify as uh, charity care. 
the legislation also uh, specifies what is eligible to be counted towards nonprofit hospitals charity fair threshold to maintain its property and sales tax exemptions. In Illinois, nonprofit hospitals do receive the sales tax exemption. So um, this was a way to um, clarify once and for all uh, what are the things that hospitals can put in the bucket to have add up uh, to continue to uh, maintain its uh, uh, property and sales tax exemptions. And then for um, non-exempt hospitals, or for for-profit hospitals, uh, the legislation also provided a state income tax credit uh, for for-profit hospitals. And this was really recognizing that for-profit hospitals really are doing their share of providing uh, uh, charity care and also providing uh, broader community benefits as well. Uh, this has been followed a lot in the news. Um, when I was looking at uh, just reading the general articles about this, uh, I wanted to find out more about how everyone was reacting. Certainly, um, uh, the uh, financial markets are reacting very favorably to this, as you can imagine, because uh, they believe this will keep the uh, healthcare system afloat uh, in Illinois and uh, not having more um, exemption revocations uh, take place. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, consumer groups that uh, believe that the um, expansion of charity care really um, moved away from the uh, uh, specific patient care and more into the uh, broader provision of community benefits. Uh, and much of that in the way of uh, uh, outreach and education uh, activities in the community. Uh, actions in other states, uh, next slide please. Um, I, I was surprised uh, in looking at other states at just how um, much difference there is in terms of who governs the policy about um, uh, requiring uh, a charity care standard uh, in each of these states. In Utah, we uh, find that charity care requirements are actually found in the state's property tax exemption standards of practice that is administered by the Utah State Tax Commission, uh, which I find very interesting. So it's not a statute, it's not a regulation, but it is um, really a set of practices that are set of standards that are required and enforced by the uh, State Tax Commission in order for a nonprofit hospital to qualify for an exemption from state property tax. So uh, we have here, um, certainly the tax uh, administration arm uh, having a say in the uh, charity care requirement provision. In Pennsylvania, uh, a feature of its uh, charity care uh, rules is that uh, hospitals must donate or render gratuitously a substantial portion of its services. So this can be satisfied by a hospital providing um, wholly um, uh, gratuitous services or goods or um, to at least 5% of those receiving similar goods or services. Now, uh, I, I just wanted to give you a cross-section of these states because um, obviously this is an issue that uh, almost every state uh, in the United States is interested in. And there's been broad interest, uh, I believe, in establishing charity care standards uh, or requirements really due to fiscal concerns. Uh, and uh, as uh, healthcare costs are rising and really are uh, driving uh, costs up in every state budget, including our federal budget, and uh, we are seeing lost revenues from these tax exemptions, it's natural to see how the two really ought to be married. And so it's no surprise that almost every state in the union is taking a look at this uh, question today. So where can California go from here? Uh, as I spoke about earlier, the legislature has certainly taken um, um, many steps to look at uh, uh, providing uh, or establishing a charity care standard and uh, putting requirements on nonprofit hospitals. Uh, I think one of the ways uh, to look at this might be to, it might be instructive to look at what other states are doing. Um, as is uh, usual in, in this case, the healthcare industry is complex. Uh, certainly, as we look at some of the definitions, even in Illinois, of what the governor has just signed, there are going to be some very severe implementation issues, and certainly um, trying to get uh, everyone, industry and consumers and other interests to agree upon uh, some of the terminology and definitions will be uh, a challenge, but uh, that is something that we'll, we'll be monitoring closely. But uh, other states have established their laws and standards uh, through their respective state legislatures. They have uh, had uh, legislatures that have been very, very responsive to the need to establish these requirements. And other, uh, still in other states, uh, some of these decisions have been rendered by the courts. Uh, Illinois moved because they were uh, really trying to respond to uh, its own Supreme Court uh, uh, in terms of having a clear um, uh, test for what constitutes a uh, charity care standard. And so as we look here in California, uh, we know that statutes have been attempted to be enacted and have not been successful in terms of actually establishing a, a standard. Uh, but also, um, uh, I work on the board of equalization. We have uh, also, I believe, the authority of the board to uh, establish that standard as well. Uh, for purposes of the welfare exception, uh, I believe that we can further define as a board uh, the definition of hospital uh, that actually looks at uh, the requirement of providing a uh, uh, a, a certain amount of, of charity care. And that is something that uh, we've been, uh, I've certainly been interested in doing. Uh, part of uh, 
Uh, my reason for being here is to hear from all of you and certainly uh, look at uh, the concerns that are here locally uh, with respect to San Leandro Hospital. But certainly as we look at it at the state level and as we examine in other states, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the Bureau of State Audits report coming out in August. Uh, I think uh, California will be uh, have a lot of good information and will be, uh, and all, these, uh, all this information will be very instructive in terms of which approach to take. Uh, I certainly have the board and I'm very, very committed to staying on top of this issue. Uh, we also know that uh, in the next uh, period of uh, weeks we will hear about what the U.S. Supreme Court will do with respect to uh, federal health care reform uh, that the president has signed and that also could have some uh, impact with respect to how the state wants to move forward. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, uh, conclude my presentation. I want to thank Supervisor Chan for the opportunity to speak on this. Uh, I hope this has been a useful uh, primer in terms of uh, what hospitals are currently uh, eligible for relative to the global exception. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to move into the, the public uh, part of the program. Um, I think we passed out slips, so if you want to see um, our my staff go around and collect them. So we're first going to hear from Dr. Robert Gingerly, who's probably many of you know, um, who's a physician who, uh, at, who's been at San Leandro Hospital for 30 years, is it? 30 years. Yeah, 30 years. Many, many years. Okay. And so he's going to talk a little bit about um, Sutter and uh, his viewpoint on San Leandro Hospital, and then we'll take public comment. But I do want to recognize um, um, my colleague who's joined us, um, Supervisor Richard Baye, our new supervisor, and uh, we're going to be working together and making sure that this part of the county 